certifications, joined several advisory boards. And um, as of today, you know, I'm the dep one of the deputy CISOs for County of Los Angeles. Um, like we're not all busy enough for my fun time. I find de-stress by competing in Ironman triathlon. For those of you that don't know what that is, it's a day of misery, a two and a half, 2.4 mile swim, 112 mile bike, and then you run a marathon and you've got, I think 17 hours to do it. So that's how I decompress, I torment myself. It's amazing to me, Jeff, that you, they know that you do all, I, I used to run back in my day and for me, a half marathon was my distance. That was the most I ever did. So for you to do like marathon and swimming and you know, I'm just like, are you crazy? <laughs> that's a lot of, a lot of stuff, a lot of work. It's the consensus, and ironically, I, just in the community that I've met in the sport, there's a lot of information security professionals, a lot of type A business execs. It's just yeah. really interesting. It's a lot of fun. So moving into um, today's topic, I just, you know, we're going to be talking a little bit just about, you know, information security management from a large organization's perspective. So um, Los Angeles County, I think it's pretty well known. We're the largest county in the nation. And, you know, just given the size comes a lot of complexity. And a common question is just, you know, what makes us so complex? Small business is complex, medium size, large business, you know, Fortune 50s, everybody has layers of complexity. Um, so what makes us complex is we have 34 individual departments, which are essentially their own businesses under umbrella of the county. It consists of approximately 100-ish thousand employees um, on average, annually, we have another five to 10,000 um, interns and volunteers, specifically within healthcare. Um, we support approximately 130 different languages. And just think about the complexity of that many languages and that diverse of a population when we're talking about voting, you know, elections, general or primary, a lot of complexity. Um, you know, we have approximately 4,000 plus square miles uh, 25 miles of beaches, and we've all seen just how horrendous beach parking is. Um, and these are all initiatives that different task forces and groups are looking at within the county to, to tackle. Um, our con constituent base is approximately 27% of California's population. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we're really a melting pot, which makes it a very unique place to work, a very challenging and fun place to work. And um, just given the, the different types of problems we're constantly dealing with, the challenges, come a lot of opportunities where we get to really get out of kind of that government stigma and try to do something innovative. Because given our size, a lot of other counties and states look at what we're doing and they start to model their practices off of some of the things we're looking at doing. Yeah, well, th this was one of the things, Jeff, that when you and I started talking about this, today's webinar, just struck me that you've got such a, diverse uh, situation. I mean, the, the, the set of challenges, the departments, the languages, uh, being cyber, the number of square miles is less interesting to me than the number of languages and, and things like that, but it just adds to the, that, the whole complex challenge of the problem. Uh, whereas if, you know, for, for small businesses, uh, you know, they typically see a little bit of what's going on in, in cyber, whereas you see the whole nine yards, if you will, this this way. It's, it's definitely an interesting dynamic in my consulting days, moving on to the next slide, you know, I, I did work some consulting work for small and mid-size, you know, even up to the fortune 15, 500. And um, some of the themes within the presentation today are, you know, some of its lessons learned from the exit, you know, current county environment, but then there's also a lot of alignment and overlap that I've seen just across all industries, regardless of healthcare, um, automotive services. Um, but before we start to dig in, I just wanted to kind of just level set, just, you know, what's a threat, threat to find. That infographic was taken out of ISACA's cybersecurity, State of Cybersecurity 2020 Part 2. Um, and I thought it was kind of interesting because when we start looking at threats, right, it's, we all know what a threat is. It's, it's the potential for something to take advantage of a vulnerability and it has an adverse effect um, it basically can cause some type of, of harm to the security fundamentals, our principles, right? The CIA triad. And um, the, the statistics said 22% is still cyber criminals. I find that kind of an interesting point because they didn't, they didn't really define what makes a cyber criminal. 
right? Because technically a nation state attacker is also a cyber criminal. So as a malicious insider, so as a hacker. So I thought that was kind of general. I was a little bit surprised that number five nation state attackers wasn't a little bit higher. Um, reason for that is just what we saw with solar winds a few months ago, earlier this year, and some of the other attacks we're seeing in the news. Um, just kind of an interesting slide. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I look at like when I think, think of North Korea and their attempts at business email compromise is just one example of that. Do they fall under the rule of cyber criminal or is nation state attacker in, 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 in that case? And yeah, I've, I've always frankly had a, a challenge with this articulation because it's I've, I've never felt the categories were clearly lined up if, if you will and i know like for example uh the verizon report does a, a good job of, of trying to sort all that out but this seems to be one of the industry challenges that we face just let's you know what how do we exactly slice and dice the categories so that every person who's doing bad things belongs to one and only one of these groups Exactly. You know, I hate to give a legal response, but you know, if you're we're talking to an attorney, it depends. It's always a gray area. <laughs> I mm -hmm. think it's part yeah. of the challenge of the definition. Right. Uh, this has always been a fun slide, you know, just kind of the human behind threats. We have our different groups, right? The criminals, espionage, terrorism, etc. But insider, it's you know, it, to me, it, it kind of comes back to the basics of just what our industry was grounded on information security as a whole. It, it always comes back to just the human factor, right? Malicious insider or a trusted insider that just makes a mistake. Look at all the phishing mm -hmm. that are currently in play. And, and then what about in your personal inbox? Um, I've had it happen to me. I just wasn't paying attention and clicked something that, you know, kind of let my defenses down with my personal environment. But my work environment, you know, I'm scrutinizing everything that comes in. Yes. Yeah. I, I added this slide in here, other threats, because I thought it was relevant because, you know, employee related, but, you know, the pandemic, look what happened to the, the threat landscape last year, just given COVID. Um, you know, COVID happened all of a sudden, for the most part, you know, organizations where the workforce was in an office all of a sudden is sent home. So it's somewhat of a reverse culture shift, right? Mm -hmm. um, having to work and function securely, especially for information security professionals, how do you secure those environments? We, you know, we don't have control of you know, home uh, Wi-Fi systems, mm -hmm. uh, even devices to an extent, you know, a person can be working on a personal device and then how does that tie back to acceptable use or just what the policy statements say? Um, and then obviously during the pandemic, because a lot of people weren't used to not having that day-to-day -day social interaction, potentially, you know, a lot of disgruntled employees came out of it. Um, different mm -hmm. types of th a threat vector that, you know, just organizations never saw before, all of a sudden they're now in play. Right. And I would think adding to the disgruntled side of it is that they added stress of, of working at home I and mean, all the, the cartoons we saw, you know, uh, a, a parent juggling a child and a meeting, a Zoom meeting, but at both at the same time and all the craziness that, that goes on with that just takes your attention away from security, if, if you will. I mean, you're, 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 not, you're paying less attention, makes you more vulnerable to, uh, to an attack. Absolutely. Or what if you're on a sensitive call and your child's you know, in their um, Zoom session with the teacher? Yeah. Sense of information, is, you know, start getting a little passionate in the conversation. You know, there's a potential for that information to be heard, you know, within in that environment. I personally experienced that, not with sensitive information, but, um, you know, it, it just really made us reevaluate how do we work in a yeah. safe environment. Mm -hmm. And I know a private sector company that just as the pandemic was getting started, as lockdown was getting started a year ago, um, had a work uh, IT workforce that was now having to work from home and they reached out to their uh, IT vendor, uh, their well, hardware people to, they needed like 90 laptops and they were told there's a three month wait. Um, and now, okay, you still have to work and, and they're in a critical infrastructure. So they, you know, they did not have the luxury of not working, if you will. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, different, just, you know, the threat landscape changed overnight for us. That's really what it came down to. Mm -hmm. uh, 
I threw this slide together. Part of it was based on last year, and part of it I don't think has really changed at all because it was a slide I actually created a couple of years ago. And the you know the common themes are still in play. You know they're much more relevant today. So obviously everybody's moving over to cloud systems, uh, bang for the buck. IT you know looking at software as a service or platform models. Um, you know it's a different shift in thinking now. You know when I first was introduced to cloud years ago. It was an immediate back to the house of no, absolutely not. We're not putting potential sensitive data, legislative data in the cloud environment. We know nothing about it. What are their controls? Who owns it? How do we manage it? So that's definitely um, relevant. It's not, it's not going away anytime soon. Um, I think e evolving threat landscape, you know, that's never going to go away. It evolves every day, every week, every month. Um, but really, you know, what's kind of the, the target, you know, that's the bad guys are really going after. Obviously, healthcare is a prime target. Mm -hmm. uh, given COVID, you know, we have high risk populations. They're definitely the people, you know, attackers could potentially go after with, you know, hopes of vaccine tomorrow types of things. A lot of mm -hmm. scams, a lot of phishing. Yeah. Um, and I'm sure you've seen it, Stan, some of the phishing attacks now, they're just getting so sophisticated. They look really good. And some of them go back to domains that look very legit. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, even this morning, uh, I was watching uh, Good Morning America uh, when I was getting dressed. And they had a story of fake sites popping up that basically mimic the .gov sites for CDC and TSA and all for travel, transportation, you know, those kinds of things. So if you want to apply to get your uh, uh, TSA certificate, uh, you there's legitimate websites you can go to, but now there's fraudulent sites that are collecting all of your sensitive information, social security numbers, credit card numbers, all of that make you prime candidates for uh, identity theft. Uh, and and it's it good for Good Morning America to point out the story, but it's the tip of the iceberg, if, if you will, um, there. And, and uh, we're also seeing, I don't know if you're seeing it as well, more attacks at IT vendors because they've got the keys to the kingdom of all of their customers that way. Absolutely, supply chain. I mean, that, that was essentially solar winds, <clears throat> which really puts the vendors in a, you know, it's, a, it's another challenging spot they're already in. They're in the, you know, for the most part in the business of security, depending on the vendor, but now the business of supply chain and what are the risks associated with that. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the solar winds, and I think some of the use cases we're going to see come out of that going forward over the next few years, I mean, essentially that's the playbook for the next level of attack. Mm -hmm. you know, just the sophistication behind that. And even, you know, what we still don't know today, which I'm sure we'll find out at some point, it's just, it's intriguing, especially when you start looking at major events, you know, supply chain, for example, around elections, around a major event, you know, Super Bowl and Olympics or World Cup, mm -hmm. it's, it's, this environment's just, you know, I don't know about you, Stan, but I mean, that's why I love this business, why I'm passionate yeah. about what we do. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's just fun. Yeah, uh, th that that is so true. I mean, uh, we we did a, a, a webinar. Where it was actually our, our technology and security management happy hour uh, on solar winds. We had Chris Taylor of the M uh, Media and Entertainment ISAC uh, discussing it, uh, and he went real deep into how this attack was done. And when you step back from the cert particulars and the fact that it was us that was being attacked you have to admire the enemy for the quality of sophistication this, that went into that attack this was really well planned well thought out well executed uh, we're lucky we found it in its own way uh, and you know even, even as we can you know admire the the technical prowess of the enemy we have to also understand this is the enemy you know, we've got to defend ourselves against this stuff. Yeah, and it's just part of what makes the job more interesting and challenging yeah. at the same time. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the malware is evolving, but because of COVID, the pandemic, you know, mobility, um, any mobility initiative any organization had, it, it really was probably expedited and sprung forward years. Yeah. Just because now how do we function and sustain business? How do we deliver product or services? or, you know, meet the demand of our, you know, a combination of, you know, constituents, workforce, et cetera, everybody's mobile, mm -hmm. it has to be. 
right? And, you know, nobody really knows what the new norm looks like. We're possibly in it now. But, you know, I, I just think for organizations that are thinking things are going to go back 100% to how they were, I just, I have a hard time grasping that because if that's the case, then what have we learned from the history that, we're, you know, we've lived through and we're currently living through? Yes. So mm -hmm. interesting challenge. And then with mobility, you know, it comes to the social engineering aspect of it. Um, you know, it just comes back to things I think all of us are seeing day in and day out. There's a lot of vulnerabilities in play every day, every week, every month, especially, you know, with product, right? Microsoft Patch Tuesday, there's always a lot of vulnerabilities and roll-up patches and things like that, but it's even more essential today to start responding and addressing those vulnerabilities to minimize what that threat could look like. So mm -hmm. social engineering, I don't think we'll ever see go away. I think, you know, now that we're more online and mobile, just what's it going to evolve into next? I think that's more of the million dollar question. Yeah. Stay tuned with the, uh, the enemy will let us know <laughs> soon enough. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. So, you know, we, we have a lot of things happening, right? And obviously I think everybody's kind of seeing the slide of defenses and there's always some kind of a castle with the moat, the high walls. It's you know similar to building a house with no doors, no windows, but how usable is it? You know, so when we're building our defenses within our organizations, we always have to keep in mind at the end of the day, we're there to enable business. We're there to protect secure business processes. We're not trying to hinder or impede anything. And that's part of the stigma of our industry is you know just that thought um, you know, when we start getting into defense in depth, which, which is essentially the slide, difficult to read. There's lots of layers, right? It's, I've always called it the m, &M effect. We always have the hard perimeter, but it always comes back to the human weakness, which is the soft and, you know, the soft center. <clears throat> Something yeah. I think all of us can relate to is um, we start looking at a recruitment post for positions, looking for an information security expert that essentially knows all of this inside and out at an SME level. <clears throat> I mean, is that realistic? Probably not. You know, a lot of us have expertise in a lot of these areas, but I've never been an expert at configuring at an expert level, every component within those. Okay. So it's- is, is this chart just another illustration of it takes a village? Absolutely. You know, in some way, yeah. Yeah, yeah and it comes back to you really, um, you know, what can we do, right? There's the control types <clears throat> and all these control types tie back to the previous chart. <clears throat> but at the end of the day, it's always people. Mm -hmm. And to your point in the mantra, right, Stan, it, it takes a village to secure the village. It's a team effort. You know, IT, information security, everything's a team sport in the end. And then that kind of leads us into, I think, the core of this discussion today. Um, one of them is a buzzword I've heard for a while and it kind of drives me crazy shift left strategy. Um, more and more webinars I've been on, just online conferences. I, I keep hearing this word come up. I did some research on it, talked to some people, trying to understand why is this being thrown around so much? And at the end of the day, it, what it really means, it was specific to DevOps, but it's really at the end of the day, introducing security earlier in your life cycle. Um, why haven't we been doing this all along? To me, this is kind of a no brainer. It's rebranding of something that's been dated. Um, you know, when you think about it, I can think of probably dozens of, you know, hundreds of projects where I get brought in to do some type of a review or risk assessment. And then it, the request comes in with the caveat of, you know, we need this done immediately because we're going live in two weeks. It's like, well, yeah. there's a lot of assumptions behind that go live statement. Right. This, this, in some ways, I think Jeff goes back to, it's been a historical problem in the industry since I first saw it, uh, which comes out of a GSO report in the late 1970s, that uh, not just looking at security, but just looking at why this project, this GSO report had to deal with uh, why project software projects were failing, mm -hmm. um, not just the security aspect. And it, it, it recommended a shift left strategy then. Let's, before we start, coding um let's figure out what it is we're going to build yeah uh what, what was the old whiskey strategy in the 80s i don't know if you've heard it whiskey why isn't sam coding yet uh, right because to people who don't get it it's all that exists is the code but it's all that stuff that infrastructure before the code 
that is really fundamental in 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 security and that's that's the shift left and it's, it's not just security but it's all the quality parameters right even basic it right you don't yeah. implement without understanding what are the implications um, just because an organization can implement something, it doesn't always mean that they should. You have to really understand what's the value, what's the impact of that. And information security checkpoints were, in my personal experience, I've had to stop some big projects. And I'm talking seven, you know, figure projects, mm -hmm. simply because of the time we would be brought in to do a review of, let's say, a contract before agreement. Um, things were missed. You know, if it's legislative data, if, let's say it's healthcare. Right, where's the business associate agreement? Why wasn't it introduced? Mm -hmm. you know, both inside council, inside and outside council need to vet that. They need to read through it, make sure they understand what are the reporting requirements in the event of a breach. And all of these things could be brought up in that initial meeting. If I'm brought into a meeting and I know it's a healthcare system with the potential for PHI, one of my first questions, if I don't hear it brought up immediately is the business associate agreement. You know, what's the data? Who's it going to? Where is it housed? There's just a basic, I think, roadmap. And um, within the county, we have a lot of templates and we've created a process around this. Mm -hmm. but it's an important question that needs to be asked immediately because if the attorneys don't see eye to eye on this, it turns into a negotiation point. And then, you know, what's acceptable risk? You know, what's accepted on behalf of the contractor or the entity? Um, Enterprise architecture, a lot of people think about this as network architecture, which it's not. EA is more of a business process. That's how I see it, because an enterprise architect really needs to be completely looped in and in sync with executive management. Mm -hmm. right? And security is typically, depending on the EA architecture, let's say it's TOGAF. Um, TOGAF is one of the most commonly used enterprise architecture frameworks. In, I'm not sure if it's in the world, but definitely in the US. Security is, happens at the initiation fees. There's checkpoints to the, throughout the architecture review. Mm -hmm. Very important, right? Because yeah. think about it in terms of just meeting a deadline. Yeah. We don't want to be that, you know, absolutely not. You don't have a BA. It's a no, you cannot go forward. But we could have solved this problem six months ago when you started, when right. the project was conceived. Yeah. Now, as, as I'm listening to you, I'm, I'm reminded of, of a story I'm potentially still in the middle of, I, I have no clue how this thing is gonna play out. Uh, but I, I talked to a company is probably six, nine months ago that had built an app uh, that was involved very extensively in, in customer PII uh, and, and sensitive financial information potentially. And I get called that, okay, we've got this app done. We want you to test it for security. We want you to do a pen test and it's like, uh, so as I started to ask some questions around it, I got all this pushback. No, 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 we just want a pen test. Well, have you, you know, ha do you have documented security requirements that we can pen test against? No, 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 we just want a pen test. And it was that sort of thing. <laughs> it never came to fruition. Uh, I've since spoken to uh, an attorney for the company over the last few weeks that they're still navigating this whole testing process and building, you know, and, and this is, it's not seven figures, but it's a solid six figures for a small business. That's a lot of money in, in an app. Uh, you know, and I, I just, from the beginning, if, you know, let's start, what are, what, what information do we have and how do we, what do we have to protect? And okay, now how are we going to protect it? Gets you so much further than waiting for the end of the, of the, of the project to begin asking those questions. I mean, your point is just absolutely so right on. Yeah, and then even think about it from an IT perspective. Um, IT should not at any point be just pulling the trigger on a product without engaging the business. Mm -hmm. IT for the sake of IT just doesn't make sense. It, it's There's fiscal responsibility organizations, especially small business need to have. Yeah. You know, it's important all the way up the chain, especially within government you know, it's taxpayer dollars that we spend. So you know, we have a responsibility to ensure that everything is done in a timely fashion. And that's where you know, enterprise architecture and different frameworks come into play. Cause you know, to me, it just blows my mind that security, even, you know, for me sometimes is, you know, we're, we're going live in a month and it's a very critical system or CJIS data as an example, you know, law enforcement type data. 
Mm -hmm. um, we need a review done within a day or two. And it's, that's just not realistic. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It reminds me if, if, if you uh, studied software process engineering and all back Mm -hmm. going on 25, 30 years ago now, uh, you know, Watts Humphrey, who wrote the book on software process, talks about management coming to IT and saying, okay, I want you to go run a two minute mile. And what does IT do? They get their tennis shoes on and start running. It's like, <laughs> there's not that awareness. Sorry, we got to push back. No human has ever run a mile in less than 350 or whatever the right current record is. You know, two minutes is not reasonable. Sorry. Absolutely. So, you know, obviously, I, th I think this is just an important awareness topic. Um, it always leads to this, you know, the, this common thought is just the challenges with aligning to business, right? And, um, I think bullet number two is really the key to this. Um, you know, a lot of the organizations I've worked with private and public sector in my services days, and even where I'm currently at, it's just the perception is what, is, what do information security professionals do? You know, our results are somewhat intangible because we're doing everything, you know, we're preventing things from happening. Mm -hmm. That's what we're trying to do. You know, a big part of what we do is awareness, you know, creating a risk aware culture for our organizations through awareness. But none of that ties down to profit. It ties down to, you know, minimizing loss. Um, you know, it's, I always, in a lot of the meetings where I'm having challenges trying to, you know, explain what it is we do and why we need to do certain things or, you know, why is there a budget ask of X amount? Mm -hmm. It's really to prevent, you know, the, the unthinkable from happening because, you know, what if it's healthcare and there's a breach and it's your patient record and all of a sudden it's on the dark web, it's your medical record, your prescription history, um, any type of historical data, what if it's mental illness related, right? There's a lot of stigma and just, discrimination that can come from some of those. Mm -hmm. so it's, it's just really that, that notion of, you know, information's what the business thinks we do versus what we do, yeah. right? Um, it's, it's an interesting challenge, but I think at the end of the day, especially within the private sector, nobody wants to be the front page of the Times or whatever, you know, their local press is. But, you know, it's very difficult to align what we do unless you're in services directly to profit. Right, because we're we're very we, we not we want to not be reactive. We're trying to be proactive by putting our defense in depth in place, by mm -hmm. creating that awareness. By you know, you're working with your clients, Dan. A big part of it is just education and awareness. Yeah, what's your sense? I mean, we 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 do awareness training on the one side, and so many other organizations do it as well, and it's focused towards the the end users as well. And we find at the same time, when we go out and like do an uh, assessment of the IT security environment, uh, lots of holes there. It's almost as if the IT vendors, the IT departments themselves need a level of awareness training that uh, we're, we're not seeing really in an organizational way is being provided. Yeah, and it, it comes back actually to my <clears throat> next slide is the opportunities to align with the business. Mm -hmm. Um, I think, you know, the first couple bullets is, you know, there's no silver bullet, but I, I think it's very important, right? Communication and transparency. <clears throat> what we were just talking about, perceived value versus realized value. Um, I mean, it is so important for the security professionals to align and collaborate with IT. These should be ongoing governance meetings. Um, I know within my environment, even in public sector environment, there would be some type of a review process. If IT has you know, they're, they're working on a project and they're about to hit the initiation fee phase. <clears throat> there would be a, there has to be a strong partnership between both sides of the house, okay. along with involving a business stakeholder. Um, bullet, I think number four right here is talking about including business stakeholders in governance process, but using their language. You know, yeah. when we start going down, let's say a protocol stack, we're talking we get a lot of acronyms, you know, we're, we're gonna set up a DMZ and do a protected VLAN and, reverse proxy this, that, that makes no sense to them. At the end of the day, what's important to them and how does it make sense for them? And I think a lot of organizations lose the business, especially as an advocate, because we're speaking in our terms, not their terms. And mm -hmm. in consulting, you know, you're, you're taught and you're trained, it's drilled into you to always know your audience. You know, in some of my customers, back when I was consulting, uh, I would sometimes have two to three PowerPoints for the same thing. 
one for the engineers, one for the mid-level management, one for the finance people, and one for the executive team. Mm -hmm. It's all related to the exact same thing, but it's different language. Yeah, that's a powerful message, that idea of taking the, the same message, if you will, but translating it so Absolutely. that it becomes appropriate to your audience. I mean, that's, uh, you know, I've had enough discussions with enough both technical people and non-technical people. You know, it's, it's, it's like oil and water. Mm -hmm. uh, they don't mix. It's, 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 it's maybe the better metaphor is two different languages, of course, and there's no Rosetta Stone yet uh, that, that connects all these together. But that just uh, that, that need and, and that opportunity to do it. Um, I mean, one of the things that we find is successful is just making sure that on a regular basis, the, we get all the people in the same room. And we're looking at the same, whether it's the threat landscape or the defensive posture or whatever it is, but we're having a common discussion around, um, you know, the, around the topic so that we get everybody involved uh, that way. What's your experience and what's your sense of, I mean, I, I see things like the NIST uh, um, risk management frameworks, the Center for Internet Security risk management framework and so on as a way of turning threat language into risk language mm -hmm. as a way of breaking through this the kind of the, 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 the barrier between technical and, and management. Are you finding, are you using that in the county? Are you finding that as a mm -hmm. uh, opportunity to generate language uh, connection? Absolutely. Um, it, it's important. I live and breathe NIST. Um, I do a lot of mappings, you know, for example, right now I'm working on defining what the risk management framework looks like for the county. So the county CISO Ralph Johnson and I, we've teamed up and we're putting this thing together and it's, there's a pretty advanced mapping back to ISO. Um, just because in the event of an audit, you know, right, one of the first questions, and I've been through several audits, OCR, Health and Human Services, is, you know, where's your current risk assessment? Where's your enterprise risk assessment? So there's mm -hmm. a difference between a risk assessment versus enterprise. A lot of organizations don't have it, and that's a common finding that OCR publishes, and they're getting dinged on it. And um, it's it's really you know NIST gives you the blueprint on how to do this. There's um, solid there's enough free templates that any organization can pull, yeah. and then it's just a matter of massaging it. You know, a, and a framework can be changed. I've seen a lot of organizations, even you know within the county departments. They take a framework and they're trying to follow a letter to the T, but you can pull frameworks together. What makes sense for your business, your organization mm -hmm. and somewhat piecemeal it together. At the end of the day, as long as it's meeting the objective and it's referenceable to an auditor, then that, that's what's going to get you through the audit. Yeah. Um, organizational culture. I, you know, I do a lot of these presentations at conferences, universities, et cetera. And I think everybody somewhat minimizes just how important understanding the organizational culture is, right? There's different organizational types. There's the typical organization where there's a lot of boundaries, right? IT doesn't talk with security. There's one person you have to go through to engage the business. But how effective is that even with trying to design an IT system to enhance and enable business? So, you know, there's a lot of challenges, you know, organizational change takes years, decades, and mm -hmm. for most of us, we'll never see it happen in organizations we work in. In government, you know, you're talking about steering a ship that's so entrenched and ingrained in practice to, to change things, you know, even a quarter of an inch, it's going to take years, if not yeah. decades. Yeah, I, I see that challenge, Jeff, with uh, in, in a real contrast between mm -hmm. a big organization, particularly government, but any really large organization and a smaller uh, organization that it, the, the culture is really the uh, kind of the, the, the uh, it's, it's, it's so functionally dependent on the personality of the, whether it's the owners or the senior management team or, you know, the managing directors or, you know, however, the, those top level of executives, they set the culture. And if one has the opportunity to work with them, uh, to change culture faster. I mean, we've seen that in, in some cases. We had a, a client um, HR person thinking she was sending an Excel spreadsheet of, uh, of employee data back to the president of the company who she thought had asked for it. It was a phishing attack. She, in fact, sent it to the fisher, some cyber criminal. And, and she was in tears when we talked to her. I mean, how did I do this? And blah, blah, blah. And, and it was 
And in part, the culture was that when the president said jump, you said how high, you know, is that kind of an environment? Well, he did a 180. He came into the training we did and he said to all of his people there, I will never send you an email asking you to do X. Mm -hmm. And he made that very, very, very clear and then followed up. I mean, it's, it's easy to you know, talk as cheap as we know, but he followed that up with some real change. And in those cases, you can, I find that opportunity to make a difference in the culture uh, really present. But then again, it goes to the challenge. My God, the, what a county organization or any government unit, if you will, has to go through to change is so... It's, it's like walking through molasses, I would think. Yeah, there's, I mean, for any organization, change is a scary thing. You know, there's yeah. some of us that embrace it and we want to innovate. And it's not about just getting the next shiny toy that we can play with. And, oh, this is cool because it has the, you know, quote unquote, machine learning. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. What's the value behind it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we have a paper on, uh, in the Secure the Village website. Um, I actually wrote it 15 years ago called Beyond Awareness Training, It's Time to Change the Culture. Mm -hmm. And it was written from the perspective of writing to the CISO. Uh, here's things you can do to help change the culture, even though you're not in that, quote, power position to do mm -hmm. it. There's still, you know, and recommendations ranging from Abraham Lincoln all the way to the Chinese Tao Te Ching, you know, uh, the, that great uh, management wisdom, if, if you will. So uh, that's on the Secure the Village website, as are a lot of the references. You mentioned NIST and Center for Internet Security and all on uh, risk management that we yeah. kind of build up that library on the Secure the Village website. So I call that out to attendees. Yeah. No, it's a go-to library. I mean, I, I have all of those sites bookmarked and I reference them weekly. It's just mm -hmm. so much information, you know, encryption, you name it, there's a blueprint yeah. to our organization. Um, one of the other challenges I just wanted to hit on is just, you know, it, it comes back to what we were talking about a little bit ago, it's just partnering, right? Mm -hmm. Security needs to not just partner with IT. It, we have to partner with the business. Um, without that relationship and that communication and collaboration happening, you know, it's, it comes back to the house of no, you know, don't bring mm -hmm. them in, they're going to slow things down. And if we can educate them and make them more aware, and part of the education is they need to understand, and this is something I've actually been successful with in getting momentum with the business to align with security, is getting them, because really we need the top down, you know, not the management, but just the support. So, you know, I, I propose a strategic initiative, creating a risk aware culture, very high level, very simple. And you can tie that back into an awareness campaign, just in general information security. You know, if we're going through procurement, part of we need to implement A, B, or C because there's potential reputation loss. And that's in huge for any organization. But I think more so for small business, because how do you recover if, you know, all of a sudden you're breached and, you know, it's an internet facing website. There's a strong username and password in front of it. Okay, fine. But why not multi-factor, right? Why not some type of advanced something to challenge, you know, challenge response, mm -hmm. not using just the dictionary adaptive thing, you know, what street were you born on? What's your mother's maiden name, which is a pet peeve when I see vendors pitch these products. Because it doesn't take, I can go on LinkedIn and probably get most of the answers off of a person that works there between mm -hmm. LinkedIn, Instagram, and Facebook. I could put a profile together and have a common dictionary for that person. It just, it blows me away. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Now, and, and that opportunity for reconnaissance, building up on, you know, just open source identification of information, just there is so much out there that, you know, any of this kind of, you know, uh, reliance on, uh, information that's public available as a way of identifying who you are, it's that's worthless in, in 2021. You know, maybe in 1995, it was fine, but it's certainly not 25 years later. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think all these points are, are very important, but at the end of the day, right, because there's a lot of just kind of a relationship between them, communication and transparency, yeah. partnering, uh, just aligning, right? Because, you yeah. know, Information or asset protection, that's the business. Yeah. Right? Well, you know, as I'm as as I'm 
engaged in this dialogue with you and all reminds me of a story goes back to, there's a, a management consultant uh, very popular in the 1980s uh, and 90s tom peters uh who tells the story in one of his his webinars or, or whatever it was uh of this company that had fallen into really bad difficult challenges it, it was close to uh going out of business new owners came in and uh turned the business around uh it became very very successful in its industry and tom peters went to interview the president of the company and uh says to him so what's the secret how did you turn this company around and the president leans over his desk and looks at tom peters and smiles and says we started talking with each other <laughs> I mean, ultimately that's what this slide says let's talk together about this you know yeah and then um to that point it's just it's not in the slide but it's just something i i just thought of and it's you know in graduate school you know more of the advanced education you know it's a, they always teach the concept of active listening mm -hmm. right being engaged and things like that in in a mobile environment that's obviously a lot harder you know, I'll be on a meeting and I catch myself between my iPad or my phone replying to emails while I'm in a meeting and then every once in a while something we're all guilty of doing this. Right. So it's just, you know, that act of listening, especially online, because, you know, that's part that's a culture thing. If I'm talking to a business person, I put everything in the other room and I'm focused on them and their needs because I need to make sure they understand the value of what we're trying to do. Mm -hmm. that we're not trying to slow them down. We're trying to enhance. Yeah. Enable their objective. Um, and then, you know, worst case scenario, if you start talking about breaches, the question is going to always come up is, well, what's the cost? And at the end of the day, you can't really put a cost on reputation loss, mm -hmm. right? Because reputation can swing any business upward or downward immediately. So it's going to be interesting to see what happens really with solar winds going forward. But just organizations that have had these huge breaches, especially if they're not big and can financially afford that to come back. It's just, it's a difficult boat to be in. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Let's see. Yeah. Um, I threw this slide in here overlook challenges. And this kind of comes back to what we were talking about a little bit ago, just with um, knowledge, skills, and abilities. Um, this is all out of ISACA's 2020 State of Information Security. Um, the skills gap that persists, persists I found the first one, 32% of that pie chart on the right is soft skills. Mm -hmm. It has nothing to do with technical know-how, education. It's just soft skills. And to me, this is something where I think it just it reinforces the fact that people really need to know their audience, know who you're talking to. And this is a point we talked about earlier, mm -hmm. right? Because engagement, eye contact, active listening, um, having some kind of emotional intelligence when you're talking about somebody and not minimizing what they say, even if it's an idea, I hear ideas sometimes and I'm blown away. Like, you know, is this a real pitch or am I being punked right now? Right. But, you know, right. just listening to understand versus listening to respond is really what it comes down to. I like that distinction. Yeah. And it goes to the seven habits of highly effective people. If you remember the book by Stephen. Absolutely. Okay. I love yeah. Cubs. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Uh, seek first to understand and then to be understood. And, yes. Uh, we listen to understand. Yeah. Well, yeah, but you know, I just thought this was a powerful slide because it, it is an overlooked challenge. There is a, you know, we have a huge deficiency in just expertise within information security as an yeah. industry right now. And I forgot how many millions it was of a shortage right now. Um, when I speak at universities, I always pull the slide up and everyone's kind of blown away. Like, well, we thought we needed you know, 10 years of experience hands on. You know, none of us started with 10 years of experience hands on. Mm -hmm. No, you yeah. develop over time. No, and, and this plays into, we have a, a workforce working group that meets the third Tuesday of every month uh, where we're, we're looking at how do we uh, both build the supply of talent mm -hmm. and also link it to the needed demand. It's so uh, that, you know, connecting the, the dots that way. Um, and what you, what you say is just, you know, the, these jobs that are available uh, with the soft skills and, and all don't require college educations, uh, which means they're, they're really well suited to help jumpstart the economy, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, particularly in, in marginalized communities all across the nation, rural and urban. Uh, and I, I see cybersecurity as a, as a 
if you will, a, a key piece of the economic vitality of the nation as we go forward. And that, I, that working group that we have is, is one of the things that I'm most excited about for Secure the Village. It's only one little thing out of many, but it's like has such profound implications to the broader, the bigger picture, if, if, if you will. Um, this is great. I don't have any questions uh, in the chat box. So certainly uh, attendees, if, if you've got any, certainly uh, let, let, let me know. I want to send off, uh, we were talking, Jeff, you and I about phishing earlier. Uh, LA Cyber Lab has a, mm -hmm. an email address you can submit phishing emails to. Uh, at one level, it goes into a black hole. I mean, you don't get information like, yes, that was a virus, blah, blah, blah. Uh, but on the other hand, it's valuable information from the defense perspective to get these phishing emails into a database where uh, now they can be analyzed and understood and, and, and so on. So uh, I just submitted that. Uh, we got uh, Alan Krantz, uh, one of our attendees, has a question. What cybersecurity certification would you recommend as the most valuable for someone experienced in IT support? You know, there's a there's actually a slew of certifications. I, I, it's funny. I was just asked this question yesterday. So I was speaking for a university. Um, if it's strictly IT support and you're just trying to layer on security know-how, um, you know, I started off in network. I think some of the strongest security professionals I've ever worked with and met all we all have a network engineering uh, background in common. We understand the OSI model. We understand the stack, how TCP packets flow. You know, if I had to today, I could look through a sniffer analysis and dissect it and figure out, you know, the sin synac and what's really happening, or if there's a redirect, potentially malicious, things like that. Um, for security, it's it's kind of interesting. So on the network side, there is a ton of certifications, right? Microsoft and Cisco have a ton of things out there. On the security side, I usually point people if they don't have security to Security Plus. Just start with the CompTIA stuff. Um, it's very uh, junior. It's not a CISSP or anything more advanced like that or a CISM, but everybody needs the foundation, right? Mm -hmm. In our profession, everything really comes back to the confidentiality, integrity, and availability. And that's a foundational concept that, you know, back to, we talked about the bread and butter of kind of our industry and that foundational, just knowledge and concept, Security Plus touches quite a bit on that. Uh, mm -hmm. Ellen, yes. That yeah. would be the most entry level, just to kind of get your feet wet in the security. Um, ISC2, they also have a certification under a CISSP and it's, it's the name of it slipping my mind, but that's also yeah. for a junior type analyst. Mm -hmm. And it's really based on risk management. Um, you know, what, what are your, I'll talk to that one in a second, Diane. Um, but yeah, it's all about the foundational knowledge, right? And then um, Diane right now just posted the healthcare. Mm -hmm. one. And, you know, the healthcare certs and knowledge, it's good to have. But if you really want the deep dive in healthcare, just you can try reading the CFR. It's, just, it's a disaster. It's a nightmare to read. I think it's one of the most poorly pieces of legislation ever written because there's so much gray. Right, and we can have a whole other webinar just on HIPAA and information security. It's it's complicated oh, yeah. with meaningful use, and I deal a lot with the county's health agency, um, a lot of healthcare in my background. But you know, anything that's just going to enhance, because if you understand the information security principles, mm -hmm. then you have, you're more equipped to handle and deal with the legislative requirements. Yeah, it's but that's where I find CompTIA's uh, Security Plus uh, as valuable there. Mm -hmm. um, in, in that way, I'm not specific. I don't, I'm not so familiar with the HCISSP, the healthcare one and, and all. Um, but again, it's, it's totally in agreement with, with, with what you said. It's this understanding of confidentiality, integrity, and availability as the kind of the foundation. And then thinking and learning to think in terms of risks and mm -hmm. threats and vulnerabilities and countermeasures is, you know, kind of the fundamental equation, if you will, of cybersecurity. Uh, I put up this slide, uh, the, the other programs in part, because as we're talking and as CompTIA Security Plus comes up, uh, the fourth Tuesday of the month is our technology and security management happy hour. And we've got uh, MJ Shore of CompTIA as our guest this coming month, this coming 
fourth Tuesday, whatever that is, in, in a couple of weeks. Um, and MJ is going to be talking about CompTIA has put together uh, an ISHOW, an information sharing and analysis organization of MSPs and IT vendors and MSSPs and so on. So it's going to be a, a really interesting talk from MJ on first what the ISHOW is and then how IT players and MSSPs and so on can really take advantage of this. Again, it's another opportunity for sharing. It's another opportunity, another illustration of the village at, at work. In this case, it's CompTIA's village that they're building. And we're just happy to be able to kind of promote it on. But it's part of this whole process that of, of just connecting dots here. They have a piece of the solution. I mean, Jeff, you've talked about so many pieces of the solution over the course of, of the day. And you know, the others, uh, even you know, things like the, the GoFish email that I just put, put uh, up there. Uh, all of these are a part of the, the solution space, if, if you will. And again, it goes back to the people. Yeah, the people part, it's just some of the job bulletins I've read, you know, private sector, public sector, it doesn't matter. I read it and it's, you know, it's such a wish list. If I can find somebody that can do all of those things, I mean, I don't yeah. want to hire them. I want to pick their brain and figure out how did you become an expert at everything? <laughs> right. You know, at the yeah. end of the day, I used to do a slide and it had the Avengers in the background, a Marvel fan. Uh -huh. Scene from the movie Endgame, if anyone's seen it, where everybody's coming back to the portals to have the big fight. And everybody had a role to play, right? Not one person had every ability. And it's all about that synergy you create through your team. And then how do you leverage that? And mm -hmm. unfortunately, a lot of organizations don't take the time to figure that out. Yeah, yeah, no, that, that, that's a good metaphor. Again, uh, no one of us has all of the answers, but collectively, we're a strong chain uh, that, that, that way. Um, yeah. Yeah, very, very much. Um, any, I don't see any other questions from the panelists. Any other uh, final thoughts before I just run through the final couple of slides? No, uh, thanks for joining today and letting me speak to you. And then Stan, maybe we'll do something on HIPAA and information security. Super. Well, this, is, this is, has been great. Uh, and as, just uh, as I say, just to, to wrap up, please you know, follow us on Secure the Village if you're not already doing that. Uh, we have a free weekly newsletter that comes out uh, that includes everything from uh, incidents of cybercrime, national security issues, challenges of protecting your home and your family from a cyber perspective. Uh, follow us on LinkedIn, uh, attend events like this one. Uh, as the slide just showed, you know, we've got uh, seven of these in an ongoing kind of way. Uh, our village library is growing by leaps and bounds. All the talk on, on risk management that we had, those documents are in the library. If you're looking for a document and it's not in our library, send us an email, we'll add it. Uh, again, it takes the village to get all of this stuff working and uh, connect with us on, on the Village Square. If you're a cybersecurity professional and looking at the list of attendees today of participants, I see many of you are, uh, you know, please connect on the Village Square if you haven't done that. It's it's free for now. Uh, and, and coming soon, I got to call this out. I think it's, I'm, I'm like super excited by it. one of our board members, Steve Krantz, uh, who's written the book, uh, Cyber Guardian, secure, uh, secure the Village Guide for Residents, has turned that into an app. Uh, secure the Village's first app. It's bundled in with the apps, uh, other apps of uh, an organization called Better Now. It's free. Um, and what makes it unique is it actually guides the user through doing the appropriate security things to protect their home, their family, themselves, their finances their credit card information, their home network, all of that with, you know, step one is freeze your credit. Uh, and that works your way all the way down through 55. I think Steve's got uh, various controls on that. So definitely look for that coming out real soon and we'll start promoting that more. Uh, I'm also the author of a different kind of book. It's The Agnostic Patriot, uh, A Citizen Searches for the Soul of America. It's, it's my own explorations over a 20-year period of essay writing. And it's not right, it's not left, it's not Republican, it's not Democrat, it's not pro this, it's not anti that. It's all about we the people. 
and the Declaration of Independence and things the, the things that bring us together, not the things that divide us. So uh, that's available should you be interested on, on Amazon. Uh, and here's contact information. Jeff's uh, uh, LinkedIn address is here. Uh, and uh, you know, certainly link in with Jeff, link in with us. Uh, next month, we've got uh, uh, Stacy Wright of the Cybercrime Support Network. Uh, is going to be my guest. And we're going to be talking about just looking at the whole cybersecurity challenge through the lens of the cybercrime victims and how the things they're doing uh, to help support uh, support the victims of, of cybercrime, make it less of, less of a, a, a challenge for us. Um, so uh, with that, uh, go back up to the beginning on, on the slides. Again, Jeff, I, I can't begin to thank you enough for taking your time. I know how busy you are with the county. Good God, 34 departments having to manage. It's like, blows me away. Uh, that that So thank you so very, very much for a very in, insightful uh, hour long present you know, discussion. And uh, as I say, thank you so much. All right, thanks for having me. Cool. All right, uh, with that, uh, let's uh, call it a day and we are adjourned. Thank you all, see you soon, bye.